When you're rich and powerful enough, sometimes crime does pay. Previously on this channel, I've covered tragedies that should have ended in harsh prison sentences for the perpetrators, but because of alleged ties to the police or an exchange of cash, the criminal was able to walk away scot-free. This is, perhaps, another one of those stories. Welcome to the Crafty Cryptid, where you can watch DIY crafts while listening to the darkest and spookiest tales I can find on the internet. Welcome to Season 2. I've been operating this channel for a year now, and I thank you for the opportunity to share my love of spooky things and storytelling with you. This is also the start of Spooky Month, and the 2022 theme for October is Unsolved True Crime. If this kind of thing interests you, then make sure to subscribe and ding the notification bell. YouTube only updates you on my weekly posts if you ring that bell, and you certainly don't want to miss what I have in store for you this month. Today, we're going to look at the tragic and bizarre case of Rebecca Zahau, a case that, according to police, is taken care of, but according to the internet, remains unsolved. Rebecca Zahau was a beautiful 32-year-old woman who passed away on July 13th, 2011, three years after becoming the girlfriend of the billionaire Medicus Pharmaceutical CEO, Jonah Shacknai. Despite the fact that Jonah was 20 years Rebecca's senior, the two of them seemed to get along quite well and shared genuine feelings for each other. The billionaire lifestyle was not something that Rebecca was used to. She had been born in northwestern Burma, or Myanmar, and had moved to the States around 2001, where she also endured financial struggles that led to petty crimes such as shoplifting. Once she met and began dating Jonah, however, her financial struggles ceased, and Rebecca finally felt safe. That is, until the year 2011. Rebecca brought her sister Zena over to the Shacknai mansion one day to marvel at the complete 180 her life had taken. But the sweet visit would soon end in tragedy when Jonah's six-year-old son, Max, took a tumble over the second-story banister. Max's injuries were so severe the doctors gave him a bleak prognosis. He was rushed to the hospital, where Jonah and his ex-wife, Dina, stayed by his side. Unfortunately, due to Max's injuries, he suffered spinal and brain trauma and remained unresponsive. He would pass away six days later. When the fall occurred, Rebecca claimed she was using the bathroom and found Max minutes after it happened while Rebecca's sister, Zena, phoned police. Investigators ruled that Max's fault was indeed accidental, but at least one trauma doctor said that Max showed signs of being suffocated before the tumble. Still, nothing came of this legally, and the death of Max Shacknai was officially ruled an accident. Two days after the incident, while Max was still alive and unresponsive in intensive care, Jonah, Rebecca, and Jonah's brother Adam had dinner. Jonah departed from his brother and his girlfriend to spend more time at his son's hospital bed with his ex-wife, Dina. Rebecca and Adam went back to the mansion. That night, neighbors reported hearing loud music blasting from the mansion well into the early morning hours. One neighbor even reported hearing clear, concise screams for help. The next morning, Adam Shacknai phoned the police in a panic. Rebecca was dead. Furthermore, she had apparently committed unaliving by tying a rope around her throat and throwing herself over the same balcony that Max had fallen over. To the police, this was a cut-and-dry, self-unaliving. At least, they made it look that way. 
But the family of Rebecca and internet sleuths have questions that have never been answered. For instance, how could Rebecca have tightly tied up her own ankles, her own wrists, and woven a complicated noose out of shibari rope before she threw herself over the balcony? While it is possible to tie one's own hands, the knots that were used on Rebecca were complicated sailor's knots. How, also, did Rebecca manage to get a t-shirt woven into the noose to cover up her own face and to stuff the sleeves into her own mouth, all while having no limbs to use? And why was she found fully nude, with her clothing missing still to this day? Police didn't seem interested in the evidence that pointed to foul play. They insisted that Rebecca had blamed herself for six-year-old Max's accident and wanted to end her life. But the evidence just doesn't seem to support that. Not only was the manner in which Rebecca was tied bizarre, but everything else about the scene was, too. The rope that had been used was bright red shibari rope, a kind of soft binding used in the Asian style of bondage known as shibari. And the bed that the rope was anchored to had not budged from its original position when she allegedly flung herself over the railing, even though it was light enough to have jerked forward in the court reenactments of the case. There is also the matter of the mysterious writing left behind on the wall of the bedroom. This is a photo of said message, written in black paint that also appeared on the rope and Rebecca's chest, but not her hands, were the words, She saved him, can you save her? Investigators claimed that this was some sort of note left behind by Rebecca, but it's written in third person, and at a level on the wall that the very short Rebecca would not have easily reached. Besides all of that, what is the message meant to refer to? Rebecca saving Max? She wasn't able to stop him from tumbling over the balcony, so how is that saving him? And who was the question meant for? Who was it asking, can you save her? Adam, whom she had been sharing the house with that night? A neighbor? The police. What's also strange is the screaming that the neighbor heard during the night, the screaming which many believe the loud music was trying to cover up. If Rebecca had truly done this to herself, why would she be screaming for help before she committed the act? After committing it, she wouldn't have been able to as strangulation and having her mouth stuffed with a t-shirt would have kept her from being able to cry out. At the very least, to an outside perspective, this crime should have been treated as foul play, not a self-unaliving. Evidence was ignored by the police or simply not brought up in court until much later. Why would law enforcement do such a shoddy investigation when the victim was the girlfriend to someone so influential and important? We all know that police should treat each case as pertinent as the next, but it's no secret that the more important you are, the more important your case becomes. Why was Rebecca's death swept under the rug so easily? Many believe this, and other facts we are about to get into, are evidence that the foul play had come from Jonah's own family. Adam Shacknai, Max's uncle and Jonah's brother, worked on boats. He had knowledge of the complicated knots used on Rebecca. He had also been looking up, uh, not safe for work content involving Shibari the night that Rebecca died. Additionally, though the police were never able to find Rebecca's clothing, they did find women's underwear in the guest house where Adam was staying. 
though it was never swabbed for DNA evidence, because of course it wasn't. In addition, Adam was at the correct height to have painted the note on the bedroom wall, and could have weighted down the bed with items or even co-conspirators in order to keep it from moving when Rebecca was pushed over the railing. There's also the matter of Jonah leaving a voicemail on Rebecca's phone one hour before her death, a voicemail that was wiped before the police were able to get to it. Could Jonah have ordered Rebecca's death? Could Adam have acted on his own to avenge his nephew? Were there others involved in the case? If so, why haven't the police investigated the strange circumstances and other evidence not covered here, like the blood found in the bathroom and the DNA of a third party present on Rebecca's body? Has the Shacknai family used their wealth and influence to avoid getting prosecuted for Rebecca's untimely and sudden death? Or is this really a case of a woman so distraught over the accident she allowed to happen to an innocent six-year-old? One who couldn't take the guilt and couldn't face the father, her beloved, ever again. According to police, this is the solution to the case. But the internet and Rebecca's family have never been satisfied with that ruling. They filed a wrongful death suit against the Shacknai family and ended up winning five million dollars. Still, no amount of money can bring their beloved Rebecca back, and it seems no justice will ever come to Rebecca's case. What do you think happened? Leave your thoughts. I would love to hear your theories on this case. My deepest condolences go to both the Shacknai family over the death of Max and the Zayhau family over Rebecca. No matter how these deaths occurred, both are tragic, and I can't imagine the pain of losing one's child or sister. If you have any information regarding this case, please contact authorities. And if you want to hear the next unsolved true crime case I will be featuring on this channel, make sure to subscribe and ring the notification bell so that you'll actually get the weekly uploads I'm putting out. Curse you, YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching, everyone, and stay safe out there, cryptids.